Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Leading Causes of Railroad St Station Passenger Accidents. This webinar will discuss station platform accidents and track-related accidents. Specifically, the presenter will discuss station platform accidents, including platform-to-railcar gap, crowd management, slip, trip, and fall, premature door closing, sudden train movement, and the role of the train operator. We will also cover track-related accidents, including right-of-way trespassing and falling from the station platform. The presenter for today's program is Dr. Carl Berkowitz. Carl has 48 years of transportation and traffic engineering experience. He has served as a litigation consultant and held various positions in industry, government, and higher education with extensive experience in planning, design, safety, security, construction, maintenance, operations, and management. He holds a BCE in civil engineering and an MBA in industrial management from the City College of New York, and an MS in transportation planning and a PhD in transportation planning and engineering from NYU Poly. In addition to his work involving pedestrians in virtually every form of transportation and its safety, including aviation and maritime, Dr. Berkowitz has written numerous reports and articles for major publications, chaired task forces, appeared on national television and radio, and made numerous scholarly presentations worldwide. He holds many memberships in transportation professional associations. Dr. Berkowitz's areas of expertise include accident studies, slips, trips, and falls, pedestrian accidents, perception reaction capabilities, subway and commuter rail accidents, speed and distance analysis, and railroad grade crossings. Dr. Berkowitz would like to take questions throughout the program. If you have a question, please use the chat or Q&A feature located on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your questions to Carl. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of this webinar. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished presenter, Dr. Carl Berkowitz. Carl, the presentation is now all yours. Thank you. I appreciate the kind words, and thank you very much. Let's get right into it then. Uh, this is sort of my... Uh, general theme, uh, that we have a tendency to uh, always blame the person who's hurt uh, in a railroad station accident that if they were more careful and they were watching what they were doing, they wouldn't have an accident in the first place. So we have to bear in mind that that we forget to think about walking as, as a basic human function, and in fact, it's one of the hardest functions that a, a, a human has to learn, and we frequently overlook it in the process that we used to develop and operate a railroad station, and thus uh, sometimes we end up with these situations which cause accidents. And let's think about uh, best practices, because in, in railroad uh, safety and, and, and subway safety and commuter rail safety, uh, there are very few standards, and most of the ways that we try to improve safety is by applying best practices. And this is a, a sort of an introduction to this concept, and best practices in terms of safety is that we look for the best ways to remove the hazard that is causing the accident in the first place, because it's my feeling that most accidents are preventable when the dangers are understood by both the, the operator of the facility and those persons that are using it, and they, those who are operating the facilities immediately identify the problems and make every effort to quickly eliminate the problem in the first place. And if we eliminate most of the problems, then most of the problems uh, in terms of uh, accidents will go away. And there's a, sort of a, a concept that's used in the field of safety, and that is that we should build safety in by design. And in the past, and even in the current uh, present, uh, we find few agencies and organizations, be it private sector, public sector, 
that try to develop safety programs where they design into the system uh, safety in the first place. In most cases, safety is a retrofit, something that's not originally designed into the system, but something that is used to adaptate the system to try to make it safe uh, to reduce the possibilities and the cost and time and human suffering of accidents. And of course, uh, the more knowledge we have and the more understanding we have of accidents and what causes accidents, the more opportunity we'll have to reduce those actions or causes that result in, in accidents in the first place. So just to, uh, from a schematic point of view, uh, how can we prevent accidents? Um, really the first step if we were looking in a, in a flow uh, chart would be to determine the cause of the accident. What caused the accident in the first place? And if we can identify the causation, and, and we also undertake uh, when there is an accident, an accident investigation, and we conduct safety inspections and practices and we review our operations, we can develop ways by which we can prevent accidents. We can develop procedures, we can develop retrofit, uh, we can track different kinds of accidents and see, uh, you know, if there is a, a continuous causal effect of each act of the, of the type of accident, and then we can develop those procedures by which we can eliminate the accidents in the first place. And of course, any program that you develop requires a constant review process, and then starting all over again, determining the root causes and identifying the causations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a, sort of a closely loop system with a never ending to try to prevent accidents. Uh, there is never an end to trying to prevent accidents. Uh, there's never a point in time where you can be satisfied that you've solved all the problems and there'll be no more accidents. Uh, I.e., uh, what happened in Italy just the other day with that cruise ship is one example uh, of where everybody thought they had fail-safe systems, but they didn't take into account human error. If we look at the hierarchy of controlling design and accidents, uh, the first level is remove the hazard, hazard in, the, in the design process. Or if we already built a system and the system is operating, we can reduce the hazard through redesign and creating engineering controls to ensure that every hazard is, is taken under control and we can apply different kinds of systems, automatic and manual warning systems and warning signs to make people aware of the, the hazards that are present and by having constant inspections of the facilities and making sure that our personnel are well trained into understanding uh, what are hazards and how to control the hazards in the first place. Let's get to our uh, subject at hand, and that's what we're going to talk about today. That is rail car gap accidents, and these occur all over the United States uh, in new rail properties, uh, in new stations as well as old stations. Crowd management is something also that takes place. Uh, is not limited to one geographic area, but takes place wherever you have uh, people and transportation interfaces. And let's also look at, we'll look at slip trips and falls, at platforms, at ramps, stairs, escalators, and the rail car itself. Uh, an area of common problem in terms of the rail car itself is premature door closing, and sometimes we have uh, unexpected sudden train movements. And we should look at also what the role of the train operator is in terms of providing for safety for passengers on uh, boarding and alighting trains and also at the train platform. Uh, I earlier mentioned that there are very few standards and one, where, where there are standards, one needs to bear in mind where there are standards and codes that it's not the highest and best solution to problems, but it's a consensus. Uh, I serve on standards committees and we vote. And in order to secure, in some cases, a 75% vote, uh, or 50%, 51% vote, we have to have a consensus of the membership. And in order to have a consensus sometimes, we have to reduce what we see as an optimum standard and minimize it somewhat so we can get participation and agreement so that the standard can be adopted. And because of that, not all standard situations are covered in the standards and codes. And one of the things that we are beginning to apply uh, to the development of standards of codes is risk assessment. assessment. And what are the levels of risk uh, and, and what
what is the level of compliance uh, when we do have a standard in the first place. Some of the agencies and organizations that are, have developed standards and codes are listed here in this uh, puzzle diagram. I'm sure you're all familiar with some of them, such as the American National Standards Institute, which abbreviated ANSI, the American Standards uh, ASTM, which is the American Society of Testing and Materials, and it's an international organization. And they also develop standards, especially in the areas, both of them, especially in the areas of walking and walking services and differentials in grade between one walking service and another, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the American Railroad Engineers and Maintenance Away Association, the American Public Transit Association, the federal government, the U.S. Department of Transportation, the U.S. Access Board, which uh, developed standards for the American Disability Act, and there are a lot of professional organizations that also develop standards such as the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, the American Railroad Engineering Association, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, all have various standards and guidelines out there to help in making a, a transportation platform safer. This is just a brief description of some of the activities of the organizations that I previously mentioned. And uh, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, and some of their publications and some of their standards that you might want to refer to in terms of making a rail a transit platform safe and secure for the traveling public. Uh, platform to Rail Car Gap has been around a long time. Uh, it's received a great deal of publicity in, in England, if any of you have ever visited London Transport, you remember the symbol uh, through the London Transport symbol. They put the symbol Mind the Gap. You can get T-shirts and handbags and all sorts of paraphernalia, and they make a concerted effort all the time to promote uh, being aware that there is a gap between the train and the platform. Uh, it's interesting that the New York City subway, and if you look at the first picture, this is the City Hall station of the New York City subway, on the day that the system opened, the first accident was a person falling into the gap, which you can see uh, there was a very curved platform, and a person fell into that little gap on the first day of service of the New York City subway system. And this was the first station on that line. There are two types of gaps. There's the horizontal gap, which is the distance between the edge of the platform and the edge of the train door threshold, and there's the vertical gap, which is sometimes uh, neglected. Uh, most people, when they think of the gap, they think of the horizontal gap, but really the gap is the combination of, of both the horizontal and vertical, and there have been many studies in that area. The vertical gap is the distance between the top of the platform and the edge of the train door threshold, and you can see from picture four what, we, what is the vertical and what is the horizontal gap, and you can see from that picture that the vertical gap can be quite significant, as it is in each of these three pictures after the original one of the New York City subway. There are two types of uh, platform designs. The, the, the platform we looked at from the New York City subway is what we call the concave type, and that's uh, where the, the platform curves away from the train. And then we have the convex type where the platform curves to the train. And you can see that wherever the door position is, that the gap measurement will be different based upon the curvature of the platform. In, the ter in terms of the convex platform, the inner door, the middle doors have a, a smaller gap than the outer doors, and conversely, in the concave platform, it's the other way around. If we were to uh, develop a, a matrix of guidelines to what makes a safe passenger boarding or alighting, getting off a, uh, a train, these would be the areas of, of key concern. The accessibility, what kind of warning systems, uh, is the boarding level, is there clarity to boarding, is there clear boarding, is there enough conspicuity so that one can determine that there is a gap, uh, are we ensuring that there's a continual path, path? is there a detectable warning, uh, is, it, is the gap something that the passengers are going to expect, is there some kind of expectancy, uh, because most accidents occur 
when something occurs that is un- unex- unexpected and uh, what kind of information is provided? Is it passive? Is it active? Uh, what kind of security is provided? Is there good lighting? Is the surface smooth? Is there sufficient visibility for the passenger to understand what's taking place at that point where there is a boarding between uh, the platform and the rail car or conversely a lighting from the car, rail car to the platform. There are in, in service in the United States, there are two primarily, two primary types of uh, passenger platforms. The low level platform, which is nearly at ground level, and the high level platform, which is where the passenger can go from the platform straight onto the train without having to climb any steps or to use a uh, step stool as shown in the in the picture on the left hand side. There's also what we call mid level platforms which are somewhere in between the low level and the high level platforms. As I mentioned earlier, we have the horizontal and vertical gap and this is important to keep in mind. Uh, research work that has been done in England and in the and in the European Union, uh, particularly in, in the Netherlands, has found and determined that when calculating the gap, you have to calculate it based upon the horizontal vertical gap and saving geometry, uh, calculating the hypotenuse of a right triangle, uh, we're close enough by adding the vertical difference and the horizontal space together to get an approximate uh, gap. Uh, of course, uh, it would be more accurate if we use the hypotenuse of a right triangle, but this gives us a very good estimate of the gap. And most uh, engineers and, and experts, uh, when viewing the gap, generally only consider the horizontal, where the vertical is very important as well. The vertical could either be positive, which is in this case, or it could be negative, where the, the train door is below the platform. And this, uh, this uh, occurs from time to time. And there's something that uh, should not be uh, uh, should be avoided. In fact, the New York City Transit Authority, uh, in their uh, in their guidelines, uh, states that they feel that the train should always be above the platform and never be below the platform. Something interesting took place uh, in just recent uh, months. In fact. Uh, for a long, long time, municipalities uh, would uh, establish a standard, and the municipality, if they adhered to that standard, would be eligible for qualified immunity. Uh, there have been uh, several cases that have uh, transpired in New York State in the last several months, which questions uh, the, the method by which the standard is established or the guideline is established in the first place. The first case was Sanchez versus the City of New York, and this went to the, uh, the, the, the agency that operated the trains, uh, was granted a summary judgment, and the attorneys took it to the Appellate First Division, and the Appellate First Division uh, uh, reversed the decision of the uh, Supreme Court, which is the first level court in, in New York, and, uh, and stated the following, that the defendant failed to meet its burden of demonstrating it is entitled to qualified immunity. That the defendant presented no evidence that a public planning body considered and passed upon the same question of risk that would go to a jury. And that the defendant also failed to establish its entitlement to judgment as a matter of law. Uh, this was followed uh, just uh, a little over a week ago uh, in Cisolanos versus New York State, and also went to the New York State Appellate. And in this decision, they made reference to the Sanchez case, but they even went further and said that the defendant submitted a self-generated internal memorandum without citing any basis for the standard contained therein. And, and, and then the appellate further stated, a jury must be satisfied with the reasonableness of the common practice as well as the behavior that adhere to the practice. And third, defendant's compliance with its own internal standard is not sufficient to grant summary judgment. Uh, for the more detailed opinion, uh, you can Google both of these cases and you'll find them both online and I think you'll find them interesting reading. Let's uh, talk a little bit now about uh, platform crowd management. This is a, 
a complicated issue, mainly for the fact that uh, circumstances sometimes be on the control of somebody operating a transit system. Uh, for example, train delays uh, on one part of the system and trains operating normally in another part and just dumping more and more people onto the platform. Uh, there's a wide, wide range of factors that uh, influence, uh, and some of these factors are such things as physical layout, the operating environment, how crowd flows, uh, where do crowds gather on a platform, even though a platform may be five or six hundred feet long or even longer, uh, crowds tend to congregate at specific locations such as stairways, uh, 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 there was an article in, in a newspaper just recently if that if you want to get on a train, that the best being uh, trying, and, and it's a crowded train, try the first and the last car. It tends to be more space because people tend to crowd towards the middle of the train. So these are some individual factors. Uh, information and communication also can play a role. Uh, there are other management factors also that come into play. But one of the difficulties that we have is how do you measure uh, the, the crowd on a platform because the crowds are, are fluctuating, they're moving, and uh, how do we go out there and measure it? Uh, so uh, I came up with this notion, uh, a way of identifying if a platform is crowded or not. Uh, most uh, train operations uh, consider a platform crowded if it has a level of service uh, less than level of service C. So level of service C would sort of be at the borderline of congestion on a platform. So if you were in a level of service D, well, that's with uh, LOS, or E, or F, and if you notice in parentheses, it's the amount of square feet that an individual occupies uh, at that particular point in time. So it seems to me that we needed a better way of making an instantaneous evaluation of crowding, so I what I, I developed is what I call my crowd queue. If there's a, if you can see the entire person, such as in the first picture, then you know that, that there is no crowding issue. You can, it's quite obvious. And if you can generally see the total body visibly of a, of a passenger, even though there may be more passengers than in the first picture, I, I would say that's not a crowding issue either. Then when you see a partially obstructed body, such as uh, picture number two, uh, you can begin to see that we're beginning to approach uh, uh, where passengers have restriction in circulation, and we're beginning to uh, encounter a situation where there is a, a possibility for minor crowding issues. Then we have, uh, when you have the only the passenger body and head visible, as in as in uh, picture uh, D, and, and, and we're definitely in a crowded condition. I mean, we can accept that, that that's a crowded condition. And when we only see the shoulder and not parts of the body, uh, then we know we're even more severe crowded condition. And then we reach the uh, level of crowding that we have in the last picture, which is just total crowding where all you see is head. And, uh, and we know that, that in most cases, D, E, and F are probably not acceptable in terms of operating a, a platform and to dealing with platform crowding. Uh, I mentioned a few of the uh, overcrowding factors before, but let's just review a few of them again. Uh, these are some of the things that cause overcrowding, and one thing to keep in mind is train timetables and how multiple train lines interact with a platform and when passengers arrive and the positioning of stairs, escalator ramps, and elevators, where passengers like to gather, gather uh, peak flows, and these are a whole series of different factors that in, in, in any one crowding situation, in most cases, almost all of these kinds of uh, factors uh, will come into play. And here we have uh, 20 different factors, and I'm sure there are more that I haven't thought of. But this is a very good starting point on some of the things that need to be kept in mind in order to uh, prevent crowding, because one of the outcomes of overcrowding is a person could be pushed off the platform onto the, onto the track. How do we measure uh, level of service uh, in terms of walking uh, by counting the number of people and, and how many square feet they occupy? This is not that simple to do. There are computer simulation programs that do this, but the, the level of services that are developed, uh, that are applied, with, which were developed by my professor in college, Dr. Fruin, 
uh, in order to calculate these levels of service, we use time-lapse photography, uh, which was a very laborious uh, way of doing it. In fact, we had to read every frame individually, and I think we ran about 24 frames a second. Uh, but there are computer simulation models based upon information on, on ridership. Uh, for example, New York City subway has a lot of good ridership information because of the MetroCard and other systems that use automated fare collection, uh, such as MetroCard or WMATA, which has a different type of card, and others. Uh, we can get good information as to the number of passengers that are on the platform at any given time and calculate the, the level of service. The level, the level of service we're more concerned with in terms of, of uh, crowd management is the level of service which we call uh, queuing. Uh, Matt, do we have any questions? Uh, uh, we have one that came in, um, and for all the attendees out there, please feel free to submit your questions. We're going to try to answer them on the fly. But, uh, Carl, are there best practices, signage, personnel um, that that you can identify or reference uh, to help um, stations manage the crowds on the platform based on the metrics, on the matrix that you discussed in the uh, previous slides? So in, uh, in other uh, in a lot of places, they, they in, in fact, I've seen this in, in England, they prevent people from entering the platform. When there's crowding, they uh, cut off the flow of passengers to the platform so that the platform can't be crowded, isn't crowded. Uh, they make announcements uh, that the platform is crowded to so please, you know, wait wherever you are and not proceed to the platform at this time. Uh, there are, in New York City, for example, they have uh, platform conductors to assist passengers in, when you have uh, difficult situations. And uh, in some cases, they, they in some systems, they cut off the turnstile so that people cannot enter the system. They shut down the turnstile so people cannot enter the system. Uh, and, and, you know, once a certain level of passing. Crowd control, you know, the same kinds of crowd control that should be used at platforms are also should be are used at baseball games and football games, concerts, uh, school events and things of that nature, the, the concepts are basically the same. You need to manage the crowd. And uh, if you manage the crowd, then you won't have, uh, you know, the level of service D and F uh, that I, I, I've been discussing, where you have less than seven feet, square feet per person. Uh, and you can have as little as two square feet per person. To think about what two square feet per person is, it's like packing an elevator uh, like a sardine can. That's about, I mean, with the, a person's hands at their side and can move from one direction or another. Uh, gentlemen uh, can tolerate that situation. Women find it quite offensive to be in an environment of level of service, D, E, and F, actually. Okay, great. I don't see any questions. And like I said uh, before, to all the attendees out there, if you have any questions, Please feel free to submit them, and we'll try to answer them on the fly. But, Carl, why don't you continue on with the presentation of content? Okay, I'd be delighted to do that. So, just to go over how to calculate the level of service that we've been talking about, this is the six steps uh, that you can use to calculate. I won't go into too much detail, but one thing I want to bring to mind, that uh, if a platform measures 20 feet across and 600 feet long, it's not 1,200 square feet because you have to deduct uh, such things as uh, queuing areas, the tactile strips, the 24-inch yellow strips that we find at the edge of platforms. We have to deduct for uh, stairs and elevators and escalators and information signs, tensions and garbage cans and receptacles of other kinds, the telephones and emergency boxes and, and fire equipment. And also, when people walk, uh, they can walk, uh, you know, pressed against these, so we have to build an also a buffer. And uh, we have to build in a buffer around any obstacle so that also deducts the amount of square feet that are available. So if we know the amount of square feet that are available and after these deductions and we know how many people are on the platform, we can easily calculate the level of service. And we also have to keep in mind that people don't use certain portions of the platform, like the ends. So sometimes we need to deduct those out as well because they're not being used for some reason or other by the traveling public. Slip trips and falls can occur almost anywhere in the, uh, past the platform environment. It could occur at, at the escalators, at the stairs, the ramps, 
uh, stepping on and off the rail car, walking into the rail car, on the platform itself. Most slip trips and falls can be attributed to either poor design, poor maintenance, uneven walking surfaces, changes in elevation, uh, loss of balance on the part of the passenger, expansion joints which are, uh, uh, for some reason or other, have moved and have not uh, returned to their previous position, and the expansion joint material uh, has risen or has settled in, uh, causing a slip, trip, and fall possibility. The preventive measures to prevent slip, trips, and falls are are quite basic. Uh, we can use passive and active devices to uh, warn passengers. We can use information systems to also warn passengers. Uh, uh, we also need to keep clean and maintain and repair those areas in the environment that uh, passengers or pedestrians are walking in. And uh, if we keep those things in mind, we can do a great job in terms of reducing slip trips and falls, which are a major problem in the platform environment. Uh, one issue uh, for platforms that are outdoors and are subject to the weather is that we have a coefficient of friction at least uh, 0.5, and, and when there is damage uh, to the uh, platform surface, that whatever uh, repairs are made, that we match the smoothness and the roughness of the of the platform uh, that we are repairing in the first place. And we also need to keep in mind, I've seen uh, platforms that were built 40 or 50 years ago, and you can see uh, worn areas where th areas have been worn down just by constant use over the time and with no effort to remove these uh, depressions from the, from the surface. Uh, stairs are a very interesting area. Uh, not only do we have stairs in, in the, onto the platform or off from the platform, we also have stairs uh, when we have a low-level platform uh, to climb up into the train. Uh, lots of trains, uh, some trains, uh, they use just a simple step stool to get on the train because the, the floor of the train and the height of the platform is such that uh, stairs are not required. <coughs> But where stairs are required, uh, this is very important. There are a significant number of agencies and organizations that have generated design standards and codes, and it's pretty well established what the, the range of riser height, that's the height of the stair, and the tread, that's the, where we step our foot on, and the depth of the tread. These are standards that have been well established uh, by local governments and building codes, by Governmental agencies, <coughs> excuse me, by governmental agencies, by uh, international code organizations, uh, by the American Disabilities Act, others, and they're, they've established that consistency and rise of height and tread depth are very important to preventing slip trips and falls on stairs. Uh, you can't have a, a, a seven inch rise and then all of a sudden an 11 inch rise. Uh, people are not used to that. That's a change in, uh, in the environment and it can create a significant problem. And these have to be looked after carefully and inspections and preventive maintenance are important to ensure that stairs are well kept and maintained because they can serve as a, a common cause of uh, slip trips and falls. Uh, ramp issues uh, are slightly different. Uh, uh, the ramp issues combine the slope and, uh, and surface coefficients uh, which are less than 0.5, even less than that sometimes. There's also concern about the concrete being worn smooth because of the constant traffic and that creating uh, a low coefficient of friction, also creating an opportunity for somebody to slip and fall. And also those who are less uh, capable of uh, maintaining their balance on a steep slope or a gradual slope, there should be handrails which they can use in order to assist them on the use of the of the ramp. Uh, there are standards developed uh, by the American Disabilities Act for what is an acceptable uh, slope, but we have some systems out there that are predate the American Disabilities Act, and uh, these, these uh, ramps, uh, which are not in compliance, uh, need to be considered to be maybe replaced or 
provide significant guidance to make uh, passengers aware that, that this, this is a very steep slope and to be very careful. Uh, escalate issues, uh, a lot of the escalate issues uh, revolve around the young children being hurt because uh, the, the children are not familiar with the, the speeds of the escalator and the manner in which one gets off an escalator at the top of the bottom. Uh, in uh, some countries, they somehow devise a way excuse me, to slow down the escalator at the top and the bottom so that people can enter at a slower speed and then take the escalator at a more advanced speed. Uh, I haven't seen too much of this in the United States, although I've seen a lot of this overseas, uh, especially in uh, in Europe and in Russia. Uh, there has been uh, this, these fail-safe systems of uh, clothing gets caught in the in the, uh, in the escalator or a foot or a shoe, and somebody suddenly stops or it automatically stops on its own. Uh, people can get thrown, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and we also always have to be concerned about clothing being caught and fingers being caught and being able to, uh, what we do and when you have uncontrolled or unsupervised children, parents should be encouraged to supervise their children while they're on the escalator. Uh, and I've seen many a situation where the kids, instead of going down the down escalator, somehow they like to go down the up escalator, <laughs> things of that nature. And another issue is uh, is a person boarding the train and, and trying to uh, reach their seat, and before they have an opportunity to reach a seat, especially uh, uh, seniors, the train suddenly takes off, and what happens is the, this force, which we call the jerk race, causes the passengers to lose balance and fall, fall to the floor. There are a number of standards that have been developed in this area for for the acceleration or the acceleration of a train uh, when it comes into a station to ensure that passengers do not feel the acceleration and do not uh, get thrown because of the rate of acceleration. Uh, a lot of uh, equipment, uh, new technologies and a lot of equipment have uh, built-in uh, regulate uh, systems where they can regulate the rate of change in acceleration per unit of time so this uh, jerk rate is uh, under is in an acceptable area where the passenger isn't thrown uh, initially until they reach their seat, or if they're standing and holding on, they don't get thrown because of that sudden acceleration force on their body. Uh, in the news all the time, we read about uh, train door accidents, uh, doors opening where they're not supposed to, train doors uh, catch, catching the uh, People, uh, there's a, a very popular picture on the internet where you see a child caught in a stroller being dragged along the platform. Uh, sometimes uh, these incidents uh, have a happy ending, but many times they do not, and the injuries can be significant to the passenger if the doors uh, do not operate properly and someone is caught between the door uh, and or the platform side or uh, the door and the train. Uh, you can see that if the person is boarding the train and gets caught in the door, there could be significant consequences. Some of the uh, train doors around the United States have sensitivity strips, which uh, will open the doors if there's a force of 20 pounds, 25 pounds per square inch applied on that sensitivity strip, the door opens. Some systems depend upon the, the train door operator, the in New York City, they call it the conductor. In, uh, in uh, other cities, they could be called train operator or whatever. Uh, and it depends upon them to ensure that someone is not caught in the door. They have to visually take note to make sure that no one is caught in the door. Carl, we've had a couple questions come in. Would you like to address them? Sure. Okay. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the act? that you just referred to a couple slides ago dealing with the safety issues concerning platform surfaces? Uh, well, the, uh, the the American Disabilities Act, for one, has a coefficient of friction, uh, which they recommend, which uh, I think is uh, somewhere like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, something like that. I, I don't remember what's the topic. In that neighborhood, uh, there are 
various studies that have been done by organizations such as ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, and the American uh, Society of uh, uh, ASTM, American Society of Testing Materials. Uh, they have looked at the walking surfaces and, 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 and footwear in terms of uh, what kind of surfaces are needed and, and uh, what surf, you know, what level of coefficient of friction would make a safe surface. Okay, great. We have a question here um, from Ryan who asks, does New York City building code apply to subway staircases? Uh, probably not, but that's uh, it's a that's a valid standard to consider. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, transit companies are basically unregulated. Uh, uh, commuter lines uh, between uh, that go between cities and suburban areas are regulated by the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, there is no similar regulations for the subways, and the subways around the United States are basically un under, because of funding under the Federal Transit Administration of the U.S. Department of Transportation, but they don't have any teeth in terms of uh, setting standards for what we're, what we're discussing. Uh, but there are standards out there, and uh, these standards are promulgated by uh, significant en uh, engineering uh, studies and, and, and public bodies, and even though the the, the transit authority of the city of New York may not have a standard, I would think they would be obligated to have to follow the, the accepted standards, which are the best practices and, and, and have been fully accepted by everybody in, in, in the United States and, and even abroad. Does that come in? Uh, sorry, Carl. We, came, we had a question that came in related to what you're talking about right now. Um, are there pressure sensitive train doors? Are pressure sensitive train doors effective to prevent door closing injuries or at least moderate the severity of the injuries? When they're working properly, probably, properly, yes. Uh, even with the sensitive strips, sometimes uh, there's a, it becomes a maintenance issue. They, as I mentioned, that the standard that was set for the sensitivity strips by the American Public Transit Association, I believe, is 25 uh, pounds per square inch. Uh, if that sensitivity is not, built, you know, through maintenance is not maintained, and let's say it jumps up to 100 pounds per square inch, a person could get caught in that door. So even though there's a sensitivity strip, there is also, the, you know, if it's not properly maintained and cared for, uh, there still could be accidents. Uh, you know, just like uh, all the new technology in automobiles, like uh, rear cameras and front cameras and side cameras, if you don't maintain them, they don't serve their purpose. That's the same thing with sensitivity strips. They must be maintained. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation of content, Carl? Okay, go. Uh, basically, here are some of the uh, – this is a compilation of all the different types of door incidents that you'll find. Uh, doors opening or failing to open or close or interlock failures. Uh, we have a door that uh, interlocks and – and the train cannot proceed unless the interlock is in place, but sometimes we have failure. Uh, there are incidents around the United States where doors opened on the wrong side by themselves. Uh, uh, obstructions and failures and drags and door panels just feel with free wheeling, opening and closing by themselves, like uh, there's uh, some kind of ghost operating it. And uh, we have door failures where they completely close and lock and nobody can get off the train, which is, I uh, think all these things happen. And maybe there are others that I'm not familiar with, and if somebody knows of something else, I would be happy to learn about it. Uh, In-car falls, I talked about somewhat when we were talking about uh, uh, jerk. Uh, and in many cases, uh, in-car falls are because of something that the train driver uh, might have done in terms of suddenly accelerating or decelerating, or it could be something, just a simple thing is, the, the suspension system of the rail car has not been maintained, and because of the inadequacy of the suspension system, the train could sway. And the solutions, of course, are maintenance, uh, you know, good maintenance and, and training and supervision of those who operate the train. These are uh, some of the human factor uh, issues and human errors 
that I've discovered over, over time, and I'm not going to get into too much detail because we're running so late on time. I see we only have about 15 minutes left, and I have about 30 more slides. So uh, some of the errors are attention, perception, knowledge, rule violations, procedural errors, slip, lapse, mistakes, fatigue, and these are the description of those types of situations. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding in terms of perception reaction. Perception is you see something and you react. How long does that take? Uh, how long does it take to perceive the information and react to the information? And a lot of the studies that were done were, were motor blind in a the sense. They weren't done for rail or for highway, for cars or bus or airplanes. They were done in the laboratory and they were based, uh, done by psych, uh, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists who, uh, uh, without the participant really knowing, uh, determined various perception reaction times in different situations. And, uh, based upon this laboratory work, uh, design standards have been uh, established. The design standard is not the time that it takes to perceive and react, but is the time that's established that takes into consideration every possible consideration in designing to ensure that every kind of situation is taken into consideration, and most particularly uh, situations that involve the elderly and the handicapped. One of the things that is getting, and this is sort of a cutesy on my part, uh, getting a lot of attention is applied attention. Uh, you know, how much uh, time does a person need to do their job? How many tasks can they do at the same time? How rapid can an operator switch from one task to another? And how widely can an operator deploy attention across visual fields? And a lot of work is going into better understanding applied attention and, and, and taking, getting some control over attention to make uh, the environment safer. And I'm not going to go into this. I'll leave this uh, for your own edification. Uh, important to bear in mind is that anyone who operates any kind of public transportation or transportation or even private transportation must have a focus and must be observing and must always be ready to expect the unexpected. And some of the things that uh, play against that are when the operator has a long, hard work day, uh, work too many hours, uh, and, and they start losing their focus of attention and their cognitive resources diminish, and sometimes they don't have the operator expertise and training, which is essential for the safety of the passengers. Let's talk a little bit about track-related accidents. Uh, the human errors, uh, in order to avoid a, a track-related accident, some of these things that come into play are attention, perception, knowledge, uh, has a rule been violated, procedural errors, slips, lapses, just general fatigue. Uh, these are some of the categories uh, that have been known to uh, be of concern in terms of train operators. Has, has the train operator had the proper focus when the train is entering and leaving the station? Uh, uh, how do they deal with a chance encounter uh, that could result in a collision between a passenger and a train? Are they constantly observing the right-of-way to ensure that there are no obstructions or potential issues? Are they prepared for an unexpected event or a less? Any kind of event that is unexpected, do they operate in a predictable and a lawful manner? Uh, we talked about hard, hard day's work, the importance of focusing attention, the expertise of the operator. Uh, one of the interesting things, and there's been a lot of studies done on this area, and there's, uh, there's studies that were done by uh, a group up at Harvard uh, uh, called the Gorilla, uh, I think Gorilla on this, or something. And how faulty memory can be and how we can see something and not see something and uh, how uh, one person could see something and another person seeing the same thing sees something different. Uh, something similar to the movie Roshiman, uh, the Japanese, famous Japanese movie where four people are asked to comment on a uh, stagecoach hijacking uh, robbery and we have four different views of the same subject. 
time to stop the train. This is uh, an important issue, uh, which takes into consideration such things as the perception reaction time. And does an individual operating a train have sufficient time to break the train and to avoid uh, striking a pedestrian or passenger that might be on the track? And if we look at the elements that involve uh, perception reaction time, so generally speaking, a trained operator should be able to react in less than a second. And in, in laboratory studies, they found that uh, that train op uh, that operators, uh, uh, whether it's the train or any any kind of operator, can uh, can react in less than 0.7 seconds. And they even have recorded uh, reception perception reaction times of 0.67. But these are the things that take place. And these all take place in, in approximately one second. Even though there are standards out there that say that we should design systems for two and a half seconds, again, that additional time is, is a design standard and not a standard for the person operating the vehicle, uh, but a design standard because there are individuals like senior citizens out there that need more time to perceive and react. Uh, the applied emergency braking, uh, most, most reports you read, uh, the operator of a vehicle will say that I apply the brakes immediately. But we know that's impossible because there is a perception reaction time and nothing can be immediate. There is that intervening time before the brakes are applied. And if we took a look at, you know, this, this is sort of a, a schematic diagram of what takes place. You know, the, the initial velocity, the braking, the the deceleration, and the ultimate stopping of the vehicle. This is this is a, a reference point. If a vehicle is going 10 miles an hour, then in one second it'll go 15 feet, and in three seconds it'll go 44 feet. And we can look at it from 50 feet, you know, in the reverse. If they went a certain number of feet, how many seconds would it take? Uh, the the York City Transit Authority has done uh, brake stopping distance uh, testing, and they found that at, at a speed of 10 miles an hour, that if the emer uh, 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 in an empty car, that it takes uh, an emergency application 20 feet and normal application braking, normal braking 30 feet. And they also did it for uh, fully loaded cars, and you can see that because of the additional weight on the cars, that it needs an additional 10 feet to stop the vehicle at 10 miles an hour. Uh, there is a lot of technology that's uh, being uh, applied out in the field, and that's intrusion detection, and some of this has been tested by the federal government uh, for railroad right-of-ways, <coughs> where if somebody enters the, uh, the right-of-way, the intrusion detection equipment uh, tips it up, and this information can be relayed to a control center or to the train operator, the train operator themselves. <coughs> uh, these are actual pictures that I found on, on the internet. Uh, this is kind of interesting. This uh, child, uh, this platform was sloped towards the track, and this, and this was a, 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 a stroller, and the stroller rolled off in front of a train that was coming into the station, and miraculously the train stopped just before uh, it reached the stroller and nobody was hurt. And the child uh, was unscratched. Uh, uh, these are individuals uh, by choice or not by choice that ended up on the tracks. And you can see uh, the potential danger that exists in these situations. In Japan, they uh, have a high level of su suicide of people jumping in front of trains. And one solution that they came up with is they built these five foot walls along the platform so that the door is open and only in the, between the, the walls and and sort of uh, minimize, uh, and they have these little doors at the openings and sort of minimize the potential of people just stepping off the platform and jumping. Uh, some train systems uh, use elevator type of systems where elevator type doors match the train car doors and the only place you can get off the platform is onto the train and you cannot get onto the track any other way. Some of the areas that have caused uh, individuals to fall to the platform are poor maintenance, uneven walking surfaces, changes in elevation, loss of balance, uh, expansion joints, which cause a trip slip or fall. 
I prepare for on this. Uh, it's important to uh, provide pedestrian information needs. Uh, these are some of the ways that we can provide information. Information is very important in terms of safety. Uh, individuals need uh, good information to make good decisions to avoid uh, being injured. And uh, there are lots of standards out there. The generally used standard is the manual uniform traffic control devices. There are other standards out there as well. The types of uh, warning systems that uh, information warning systems that can be put in place include signs, markings, and other other devices. And these passes do not indicate the presence of a train, but there are also active devices. Uh, in the New York City subway, they're starting to put in the uh, arrival time of trains to stations, and uh, people could be aware. There are also other devices that are activated, such as the Washington Metro, where lights at the at the edge of the platform blink to uh, signify the, that a train is approaching the station. Uh, in terms of uh, national standards, that should be kept in mind, and these are uh, standards that are important in terms of uh, uh, boarding a, a train from a platform. Uh, the American National Standards Institute uh, recommends that uh, the differential between two uh, uh, walking surfaces should be no greater than a quarter inch, and if it's greater than a half inch, it should be sloped. So uh, this is why uh, the vertical uh, gap uh, between a train and a platform becomes kind of significant, uh, especially if it's more than a quarter inch. American National Standards uh, Society of Safety Materials, ASTM, has a similar standard, and their standard is almost uh, the same as the American National Standards Institute. The ADA also has a similar standard, uh, and this is just a diagram of the standard. It's similar to the other two standards that I mentioned. Uh, in terms of signage uh, to warn people of the gap, this is uh, the Long Island Railroad in Metro North. They have uh, signs such as this uh, to watch the gap. For some reason, the uh, New York City subway system is not using uh, this kind of information signage. The American Public Transit Association has a number of standards in terms of best uh, practices in terms of designing platforms, and this is a list of those various standards. Uh, just a quick uh, around the world, uh, Bangkok, London, Madrid, these are some of the announcements they make, uh, pre-recorded announcements to warn people about uh, mining the gap or watching watching out for the gap between the train and the platform. This is samples of some of the signs around the world uh, uh, that are used uh, to warn people to mind the gap. And uh, we all have a duty of care to, to warn individuals has hazards to probably train personnel so they become aware of hazards and can make others aware, have constant safety inspections, update design standards, and provide effective communications all to ensure one thing, uh, safety. Safety is our number one concern, and safety should be our number one uh, uh, effort in terms of making sure that accidents are avoided. And I thank you very much. Uh, is there any additional questions, Matt, before we uh, say goodbye? Uh, I don't see any questions. Um, if any of the attendees have any questions for Carl, uh, please submit them using the chat or Q&A feature, which I found on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, we'll uh, start uh, concluding today's program, and if any questions uh, come up, we'll make sure that Carl uh, answers them before uh, we close it down. So, Carl, do you have any uh, concluding remarks that you would like to make? Well, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has um, uh, related to the subject matter. And you might want to mention that we originally were planning to do railroad crossings and then we had it split it off because of uh, time, and that will be our next uh, seminar. Uh, that is right. So we'll be doing a uh, second part to this seminar in February, probably, that will deal with um, all the issues related to railroad crossings. Um, if you have a case that you would like to speak to Dr. Berkowitz about, you can contact us here at TASA. Our telephone number is 800-523-2319, or you can respond to the follow-up email that will be sent to you at 3.30 p.m. today. Uh, we'll be sending out a link to the archive recording of this webinar 
tomorrow morning. In that email, I will attach the PowerPoint slides that Dr. Berkowitz used uh, during his presentation. Uh, the archive recording will be posted in the TASA Knowledge Center. You can visit tasanet.com and click on the Knowledge Center tab found at the top of the page. Uh, you'll be able to view all of our previous webinars. Our next client-focused webinar will be Workplace Safety, Hazard Identification, and Management Responsibilities. And that will take place on January 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Look for an invitation from me uh, in the next day or so. And if you have any follow-up questions or comments, uh, we do take all your comments under consideration and they help us to put on better programs. Uh, please feel free to send me a message and we'll apply it to, uh, to our programs in the future. With that, I'm going to end today's program and I look forward to seeing you at future CASA events.